The all-seeing eye is a dynastic symbol invoking religious meaning to the re-emergence of the people of the Egyptian region. This is the most mysterious symbol, not only from the time of the Egyptian empire, but also in the today and now as the assimilation of such meanings has seen the modern age adopt such symbols in a secretive and provocative way, mocking the general public at large that there are secrets in society far out of the reach of the humble everyday earthling. The all-seeing eye may be one of the most famous of all Egyptian symbols, but it is also one of the most misunderstood symbols from a time in history when our kind came under threat from the power of the solar system. Wait till you hear this. What was the all-seeing eye? What does it mean? Is it the representation of an actual all-seeing eye in the celestial sky? To properly address the issue of the eye in the sky, then we must theorize that celestial order has changed dramatically today to what it was just a few thousand years ago. We must assume that mythology is based on fact and that answers to our past are in the mythological record classed as fantasy by modern day teachings. The people of the past have laid out for us a record of events that occurred. Their perceptions are some of the most dramatic conclusions of events they witnessed in the sky, and we had completely misunderstood these things to the point of ignorance. The vision of the earthlings who witnessed the plasmatic discharges in the sky was one that lasted ages, eventually ending up as humanoid figures waging a battle for dominance in the form of the squatter man phenomena. But before the manifestation through the ages in many different forms, the aurora first took on a circular form, radiating a curtain of aurora similar to the Birkeland Currents today. The all-seeing eye manifested, evolving to the 56 points of radiation and immortalized not only in the petroglyph record, but all over the world from Brazil to Britain. And the Stonehenge monument matches to American petroglyph patterns, for example. But why is it all classed as myth and why do we consider this the opposite of reality today? We at the Lost History Channel firmly believe that the path to the past and truth of our reality lies within these events in the prehistoric past. Ancient earthlings simply must have seen the heavens differently than we do in modern times because the present order in the sky explains nothing about these times. Neither the ancient rites of the pharaohs nor the array of astronomical symbols which grew up around the ancient ruler who was conceived as the human incarnation of the ruling divinity in heaven, not just in Egypt but all around the world. The manifestation of these thoughts occurred in the minds of people everywhere and at great distances. They perceived the same events no matter where they were on the earth. A vantage changes but the vision remains. Ritual and its symbol always refers to an age different from our own, an age when planet Saturn, the central sun, ruled from the celestial pole, encircled by his band of glory. The all-seeing eye, as almost uniformly asserted, the solar orb, nowhere is the weakness of solar mythology more apparent than in its handling of this confounding and cryptic symbol. One Egyptologist after another, by following the solar interpretation, passes over in silence the many enigmatic particles of eye symbolism, ignoring the truth as if it didn't matter and the only well-known authority to reject categorically the solar interpretation was Rudolf Anthus. After devoting extensive research to the eye of Ra, Rudolf Anthus concludes that the eye apparently never was the sun to the ancient observers, never. Strictly speaking, the Egyptian eye is neither the sun nor is it a star, but it is the circular or enclosure fashioned by the creator and his celestial home. The great god resides in the eye as the pupil, and one of the most common names of the eye in Egypt is Uthat. And the Uthat hieroglyphic combines three closely related signs, meaning to see and also to form to fashion, to create, to encircle, and to bind, to encircle. The all-seeing eye is the created enclosure, the bond around the primeval sun. 
Therefore the God has his home in the Ut Hat, the I. I am in the Ut Hat. I am he who dwelleth in the Ut Hat. Enter thou in peace into the divine Ut Hat, reads the inscriptions of dynastic Egypt. A coffin text also gives us a clue and reads that I am Horus in his eye, while the Harris magical papyrus states, I am Shu under the form of Ra, seated in the middle of his father's eye. In the Book of the Dead, it declares that I am the pure one in his eye. I am he who dwelleth in the middle of his own eye. Questions arise. Does the great God reside in the enclosure of the eye as the pupil? The Book of the Dead repeats the phrases collectively. Praise be to thee, O Ra, exalted Sikkim, aged one of the pupil of the Uthat. I am in the Uthat. I sit in as the pupil of the eye. God, the pupil of whose eye is terrible, is thy name. When the texts speak of the eye of Ra, who is in his actin, one recognizes the eye as the actin, for the Egyptians treat the eye sign and the actin sign as interchangeable symbols. Just as the actin constituted the protective enclosure, so did the eye. O Osiris knew the eye of Horus protecteth thee, it keepeth thee in safety. He is Horus, encircled with the protection of his eye. My refuge is my eye, my protection is my eye. I am the dweller in the eye, no evil or calamitous things befall me. Such references surely indicate that the eye is not the sun or the sun god, but the goddess, in whose protective womb the sun god dwells. As a matter of fact, though Egyptian ritual presents the goddess under many names, all primary figures of the goddess receive the appellation Eye of Ra. This includes, among others, Isis, Hathar, Nut, and of course the goddess Uthat, the Eye. The complex meshes of eye symbolism are woven all around the Egyptian goddess, and she cannot be understood or compared with other goddesses until they are unraveled. Yet, several interesting associations of the eye and goddess fails to discern the eye's root character as the protective enclosure. In 1980, David Talbot beautifully suggests that the only direct identity of the eye as cosmic womb will explain its context in the ritual. The child who is the eye of Horus hath presented to thee. I am he whose being has been molded in his eye. Horus is said to rear and nourish the multitudes through the unique eye, mistress of the divine company and lady of the universe. The very goddess whom the text depicts as the eye of the primeval sun are also called the house, as we should expect. As to the identity of the eye and the temple, Egyptian sources leave no room for debate. They state this as fact. The temple of Karnak is the healthy eye of the Lord of all, a striking parallel to the Sumerian temple as the house eye of the land. In the book of the pylons, Ra listens back to the remote age when I was in the temple of my eye. While the book of the dead speaks of the son of Osiris residing within the temple of his eye of Anu. David Talbot tells us that Saturn's band was the primeval cosmos, viewed as the planet God's own consort. The womb of the cosmic waters and ancient myths alternatively depict the band as a revolving island in the sky, a cord of rope forming the boundary of Saturn's domain, a shining egg, a shield, or the creator's belt. Saturn's kingdom possesses the form of a great wheel. It was the creator's revolving throne, the celestial city, the lost navel or middle place where history began to be documented. Around the border of the heavenly land flowed a circular river or ocean, and the same band was Saturn's revolving temple, which he wore as a crown and in which he dwelt as the pupil of the all-seeing eye. As the cosmic vase, the band housed Saturn's waters of life. And finally, Saturn's band appears in the guise of a shiny serpent wrapped around the central sun and denoted by the Egyptian sign. 
Separated from the archetypal enclosure, the various symbols appear as isolated forms of uncertain origin. But if that were the case, then why were these forms systematically related in language, art, ritual, and myth? It is not a question of later generations recklessly joining unrelated images because the fact remains that the further back we go, the greater the unity. The best evidence of the harmonious vision comes from the oldest sources of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Here we find the central sun wearing the cosmic city and temple as a crown, taking as his throne the eye of heaven, the holy land, or the vase of upper waters, shining in the center of an egg called the earth and encircled by a river which forms the wall of the temple, but also the circle of the gods. In case we find that the symbol refers directly to the womb of the mother goddess, enclosing the great father Saturn, in reviewing this imagery of the enclosure, one confronts many dominant motifs of ancient religion. Whatever the mythological formulation of the band, the hymns celebrate its presence at the polar center. Yet, who can locate a source of the imagery in today's tranquil heavens? Where is this revolving river of splendor and terror? Where is the city of the white wall, the clear and radiant holy land, the temple like a dragon gleaming, the throne of light, the golden egg, or the fiery serpent? If the texts present alternative versions of the band, they never question its existence in primeval times. It is the archaic reality concealed within a massive body of myths and symbols all pointing to the signs and as images of Saturn, the polar sun, the unmoved mover, the ancient sun of the golden age. The all-seeing eye isn't an alien symbol in the sense that it was perceived in the minds of earthlings. The changes explicitly depicted in the petroglyph record before assimilating into belief in Egypt of an eye in the sky manifesting into other humanoid figures was the beginning of dynastic Egyptian civilization in the wake of a cataclysm instigated by solar chaos. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching. Hello everybody, this is the voice of the Lost History Channel, Buzz Weaver. Just to let you guys know that the ways by which we express our thoughts on the internet is currently at risk. In response to this, we are expanding the Lost History channel and my own channel, the Buzz Weaver channel, to multiple different platforms in an effort to preserve our content online. If any of you are active on any of the platforms linked in the description, then please by all means follow and subscribe to us there. Your continued support is now more important than ever. I cannot emphasize that enough as thousands upon thousands of creators have now vanished from YouTube and across platforms all across the social media spectrum. As a matter of fact, we currently represent a minority who are still weathering the storm and together we will survive the attack on the freedoms that they are trying to take away from us.